Hello, this is a, uh, hopefully we'll keep this under 10 minutes, a presentation on why I believe the continuum hypothesis is true. Now I did a video series on this where, yeah, it was the beginning of my YouTube career. I don't think it was done as well as I would have liked. For one thing, I uh, muddied, as somebody who's come to be an advocate of smooth analysis, actually it's consistent with my own theories on, on calculus, I would say that um, I'm moving in that direction. I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, I would say that I muddied the waters a little bit with the zero and the infinitesimal on that video series. There actually were some mistakes that I believe I made that this video is an attempt to rectify. Now, second of all, I did another synopsis of my view on the continuum hypothesis that, eh, I just didn't think it was so good. And I got one thumb up and one thumb down, and frankly, I kind of agree with the thumb down more, um, although I appreciate the thumb up you know, the moral support. But I, I think I could, I could have done a better job, and I'm going to do a better job now. This is a very skeletal, you'll have to watch the video series for more, but this is a skeletal view of what I believe it would be an axiom that if accepted would verify the continuum hypothesis. This is not an attempt to undo Paul Cohen's proof and say that the continuum hypothesis is um, consistent well, it's consistent with set theory, but that it would be proven by it. I acknowledge that it is not. But I believe there is um, an axiom that would verify the continuum hypothesis, and it's not V equals L. It is that while zero times any infinity arrived at arithmetically, meaning not through exponential means, would be zero. So zero times all, if not equals zero. Um, that's accepted among mathematicians. I know that in calculus you can have, you know, infinite, it, calculus is a little different, but uh, well, let's not go there now. This basically zero times all if not equals zero, because all if not is discrete. It is bound by zeros and one, zero and one. It's kind of bound by a binary reality. And so the very essence of something discrete is that it can be boiled down in the base two number system to zero and one. And thus, when you, it, it has a kind of on-off reality to it. You have to think of this philosophically, that there's an on-off reality to any kind of discrete reality. And therefore, zero times all if not equals zero. But in, in my scenario, I'm positing that zero times all if one, whatever all if one is, whether it's C or whether it's C or something, meaning the continuum or, or something less the, the, than the continuum, that that would be undefined by definition, that zero times any kind of non-discrete reality would not make sense, that you would be invoking a binary reality where a binary reality would not exist. So this goes, this is not set theory, this is uh, my own axiom that I believe verifies the continuum hypothesis, and I believe, more, more importantly, I believe that it's consistent with the logic of mathematics. It isn't something out there. It's not, you know, space aliens told me that the continuum hypothesis is true, and this is the reason why. It's something that's really very logical. Zero times all of one is undefined. Okay, now let's see if um, the claim that zero times two to the all of naught, in other words, zero times C, fits with the initial assumption of being undefined. In other words, let's see if the initial assumption is verified and thus that there's no contradiction. And I would say yes, there is. And the reason why is because um, all if not to the all if not, which uh, by the way, two to the all if not is the same as all if not to the all if not. But all if not to the all if not is the same as all if not multiplied by itself over and over and over again to infinity. Now, all if not times itself is idempotent for any finite number of times that it's multiplied, but when you get to infinity, you then have that next level of, you have the level, you jump from the infinity of the of, uh, of um, natural numbers to the infinity of the reals. So that, that's a big jump, uh, just to put it mildly. That's the understatement of mathematics to say that's a big jump. But anyways, you also notice that zero is, multiplying by zero is idempotent too, that it just keeps going and going and going. And you could have an infinite number of times that you multiply zero by itself, and you're multiplying, you would say all if not number of times that you're multiplying zero by itself. Well, here's the situation. When you have all if not numbers of times 
you can theoretically have each of these zeros canceling with an off not and each of these zeros canceling with an off not and you could argue that that would arrive at zero but remember that two times off not is the same as off not right so what if i had over here i had two off not off nots multiplying you know in other words all if not to the power of two all if not, which is really the same thing as all if not to the power of all if not. So I can do that. Well, these these guys would cancel. My zero times all if nots would cancel, but I would still boil down to uh, the same thing I started off with. I wouldn't be able to reduce it. I wouldn't be able to, to really simplify it. I would still get zero times all if not to the all if not. And so the way that it's structured here, there's no real cancellation getting me zero. I don't get an answer. I just get the question, what is zero times off not to the off not restated? And so, um, or, you know, conversely, you could have two all if not zeros, then all if not, just a regular all if not here, and you would get zero. Um, now, I introduced in the video series the idea of, well, what if you had all if not to the off not divided by some um, series of all if nots meaning infinitesimals so you could and I argued that you could only do a finite that a finite number of times or you would get to something undefined I'm not going to really advance that argument now I I have to think about whether I really still believe that but the bottom line is here you get you you get a question that can't really be answered what is zero times all if not to the all if not so it is undefined but let's say that if we assume the continuum hypothesis is not true if we assume that there is an all if one between all if not and two to the all if not, then we get the same, we, we get a same similar scenario here, zero times zero times zero times zero times zero. And, and since multiplying by zero is idempotent, it multiplying by zero should be the same as multiplying zero times zero times zero times zero. It's okay, anyways, you multiply that times all if not to the power of n if n is less than all if not. Okay. Well, that has to be zero, because if I multiply all if not out, like, like I did up here, but something less than infinite, then by definition, um, I my multiplying by zeros out to infinity, I've canceled out all my all if nots. It has to be zero. So zero times anything less than the cardinality of C um, has to be zero. Um, and I don't think the opponents of the continuum hypothesis would, would disagree with that. I think that their, their levels of Aleph, um, or they might say Omega, okay, from, you know, depends what you're more comfortable with. I say Aleph, okay. So uh, their levels of, of cardinality above Aleph not, that they probably would argue, I, I don't know for sure, but they probably would argue that, that if you multiply those by zero, you would get zero. Um, but the problem is, to me, philosophically, okay, well, anyways, it, 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 it contradicts the initial premise. Therefore, the initial premise validates the continuum hypothesis. So, so I'm saying if you start with this initial premise, uh, you will get the continuum hypothesis. Now, um, the, why do I believe the initial premise? Well, again, it's very simple. If, if I have a 0, 1, 0, 1 uh, binary reality, then then zero becomes meaningful as a philosophical concept, not just as a mathematical, but as a philosophical concept. But if I have something whereby um, I superseded the level of the cardinality of the, the natural numbers, then I would argue personally that, that zero was invented as a counterpoint to the natural numbers. I mean, before there were negative numbers, you had zero and then you had something. You had, you had, Mathematically, you could you you had you had zero and then you had existence uh, in some kind of positive sense, and so um, zero as a mathematical concept follows not too far from that. Uh, in in binary programming, you have those of you who are computer programmers, you know you use zeros and ones, and you use zero as a placeholder. You do not the, the idea of invoking zero and and one binary reality for uh, cardinalities above all if not becomes contradictory because in a sense you're still stuck within the logic of of the cardinality of all of, of the cardinality of the naturals you um the whole idea of in, in other words in essence it, it, it's a little bit like adding one and then adding another one and then adding another one or some kind of discrete reality to it. I would argue that this initial assumption here, although unproven, 
by set theory, and I'll acknowledge that, or at least not, not probably not provable, is consistent with the logic of mathematics. Thank you.